Last year, when the Arab-Israeli war blew up in the eastern Mediterranean, things became suddenly very busy right here in this narrow neck of water that separates the continent of Europe from the continent of Asia, and which traditionally has bottled up the Russians in the Black Sea, just beyond that point of land up there. This is the Bosphorus, and the news about the Bosphorus is that it no longer contains Soviet power. The old tradition has been changed. The Bosphorus is a supply route now for the new and growing and permanent Soviet Mediterranean fleet. The Russians have done nothing to acquire control of the Bosphorus. Control still is in the hands of Turkey. Ships pass through by right of treaty, but Turkey can shut off all the traffic in time of war. This doesn't seem to worry the Russians anymore. Last May, just before the outbreak of fighting between Israel and Egypt, major units of the Soviet fleet passed through the Bosphorus on their way to join what the Western world has belatedly recognized as the Russian Mediterranean fleet. The Soviet ships sailed past Istanbul, where their passage since has become so commonplace as to cause hardly a stir. There was number 383, a Cashin class guided missile frigate, which uses a very modern gas turbine engine. There was number 626, a guided missile destroyer, Kildin class. And number 514, very similar, called the Colin. About the same time, a submarine tender called Mogamed Hajef, loaded with Russian sailors, crossed the Istanbul harbor on its way to the Marmara Sea, the Dardanelles, and the open water of the Mediterranean. The arrival of these major reinforcements opened the eyes of NATO members to the fact that a new status had been imposed upon the Mediterranean by the Russians, who had become not just occasional visitors, but permanent residents. The days when the United States Sixth Fleet sailed majestically and unchallenged from shore to shore to shore of the Mediterranean were over. From now on, there would always be a shadow. Ivan, as the Sixth Fleet sailed by, sometimes dangerously close at hand. Ivan, in this case, is number 810, a turbine engine guided missile frigate. It has six 21-inch torpedo tubes. It has uh, two 12-barreled uh, anti-submarine forward part of the ship. It has two twin 85-millimeter anti-aircraft uh, guns. It has a helicopter landing platform aft, although at the present time there's no sign of a helicopter being on board. If she wanted to uh, pour on those uh, gas turbine engines, what could she pass us by? Yes, if she chose to light off her gas turbines, uh, this would give her full power and she could pass us immediately because it would take us about uh, several hours to get our uh, additional boilers on the line so we could make the same speed that she can. The reason why Ivan never stayed in the Mediterranean before was quite simple. It was too difficult to sail from the Black Sea through the bottleneck of the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles and back again every time he needed resupplies and refueling. The answer to the problem was almost as simple. It was to keep the fleet out there in the Mediterranean and move the supply ships in and out of the Black Sea. This is one element in the huge upsurge of ship traffic recently through the Bosphorus. Under the Montreux Treaty, which governs the rights of shipping through this narrow waterway, all commercial traffic is free to pass in time of peace. If these tankers were listed as military supply ships, they would be required to give formal notice, 
but they do not class themselves as military. In fact, many are not. Much of this oil is bound for Cuba, for example. But many of these tankers are headed for rendezvous points with the Soviet fleet in the Mediterranean. One such anchorage, for instance, is Herd's Bank, just off the island of Malta. Among NATO political men, there's a strong fear that in the course of time, the Russians may be invited to use Malta itself as a supply base. This is just one of the many political implications of the arrival of Soviet power in this area. The Russian Mediterranean fleet already has base arrangements in Egypt, and one or more Soviet ships are almost permanently imported either Alexandria or Port Said. The flagship of this group is number 890, an old but handsome cruiser of the Sverdlovs class called the October Revolution. For the Egyptians, these ships are a form of insurance against attack on these ports from Israel. And for the Russians, they are at least to resupply bases ashore and at best points of entry for a type of Soviet penetration never before possible in the Arab world. We feel that this increase in the Soviet combatant power in the Mediterranean uh, hardly creates stability. Instead, of course, it uh, promotes turmoil, instability, conflict. And whereas we have been interested in maintaining a detente or a status quo within the countries, uh, the Soviet move is hardly designed to promote the continuance of that relationship. What would be the problem for an aircraft carrier such as the FDR in case of combat with this guided missile capability of the Russians? The primary uh, weapon that we would have in the aircraft carrier, of course, is our fighter aircraft. This aircraft has a very fine air-to-air -air capability as well as air-to-surface. And this is what we would employ initially against any surface ship uh, trying to oppose the carrier. We would try to hit the opposing surface ship far enough out from the carrier so that he would not be within range of his surface-to-surface -surface missile. The Sixth Fleet has been the queen of the seas in the Mediterranean until now. Immensely powerful and mobile with its ability to take ultra-modern, deadly air power within striking range of any trouble spot, constantly ready for combat. A superbly trained, marvelously constructed fighting machine. The appearance of Ivan on the scene hasn't changed the fleet's methods of operation, but it has made them more complicated. I think the, the key point is that they are shadowing us they are observing us, uh, but they are not uh, harassing us, uh, so that uh, in no case has it been our experience that they have interrupted in any way our uh, normal operations. They uh, follow the rules of the road. We follow the rules of the road. Uh, we are watching them closely, just as we watch any surface craft that are in the area of our uh, formation. You're getting rather used to him now? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we can afford to be complacent at all, but uh, he's usually uh, with us uh, most of the time. Uh, yeah. The <laughs> Russians are here. The Sixth Fleet has been able to serve as an extension of American influence far from home base because it has learned to be self-sufficient, to operate indefinitely at sea without needing port facilities, taking on oil while underway as well as taking on all other supplies, including ammunition, is a well-practiced art. This is one of the things the Russians have studied and are learning to do for themselves. For Admiral Lambert, there is no question but that the Russians are engaged in a confrontation of power in this area. Our peacetime mission, of course, is to demonstrate to our allies our readiness and capability to provide uh, the 
freedom of the seas for them in the event it is, uh, it is denied by any hostile power. Naturally, with the uh, uh, growing Russian uh, naval fleet, uh, this supremacy, which we now enjoy, is threatened. And if it becomes so powerful, then we might not have the ability, in conjunction with our NATO allied navies, to maintain this supremacy. We feel that it is a serious threat. Along the Bosphorus, at a casual glance, you'd never know anything special had happened. Life on shore seems not to have changed in generations. A closer look at things discloses the ever-growing traffic by Soviet ships, commercial traffic that carries expanding Soviet trade to more and more of the world, and commercial appearing traffic that goes to support the developing Soviet fleet away from home. Ten Soviet military ships made the outward voyage. Two tugs towing two patrol craft, three transport ships, one AGI intelligence collector, one light guided missile cruiser, and one guided missile destroyer. The Soviet fleet in the Mediterranean is at peak strength, between 40 and 50 ships. That means they have now as many as we have. This is Frank Burkholzer, NBC News, reporting from the Mediterranean.